Uh, do I need this? Okay, fine. Please do um, So, good morning, and thanks for coming along to see this talk. Um, this talk is sort of threats, actors, and capabilities. So, it's going to be oriented towards um, it's a security talk and sort of about the security risks that face mainly human rights activists, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some specific threats and actors in the region. Um, my name is Morgan. Um, for those who aren't aware, I'm currently the director of security at First Look Media, um, which is probably its most famous product is The Intercept. Um, it's sort of best known for reporting and publishing documents that were leaked by this man. Uh, Edward Snowden, so it's sort of Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras, Jeremy Scaven, and so forth. Um, I currently worry about their manifold security concerns, uh, which is a completely stressless job. Um, prior to this, I was a uh, senior security engineer at Google for uh, six years, and I worked as a penetration tester for a firm called Security Assessment. Security firms love having really bland names for some reason, like it's really reassuring. So like there's a lot of them, you know, sort of security assessment, that sort of thing. Um, I also sort of have affiliations with a number of organizations. A lot of the work that was done in this presentation uh, was done in affiliation with Citizen Lab out of the University of Toronto. Um, some of it was also done with the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. Um, I also advised the Freedom of the Press Foundations and uh, UNICRI, which is uh, United Nations Inter-Regional Crime Justice Institute. Um, so a lot of this talk is actually going to be sort of around surveillance software. Um, because of my background, which is a security engineer, I will probably use sort of terms like surveillance software, implant, and malware almost interchangeably. Um, I'm presuming most people in the audience will be loosely familiar with these concepts, largely based on kind of stuff like this, right? Like most people have been on the internet for any period of time. Um, you probably learned to have sort of this you know, sort of cursory ambient worry about viruses and malware and the like. Um, what I'm actually going to be talking about today, so you know, when people ask me sort of what malware is, I, I like to tell them that it's sort of any software that shows up on your computer uh, without an end user license agreement. So if you can click on it to say, yes, I want to install this, then, it, then it's malware. Um, but for, for the purposes of, of this discussion, we're talking about software that essentially records stuff that people do on their computers. Um, documents they type, conversations they have, communication, um, video chat, and so on and so forth. I mean, largely all the things that you might want to surveil um, of, of someone's online action. Um, now, Google has gone mobile, and obviously so has government spy. And so a lot of for, for mobile platforms. And I've seen suites of commercial software available for sale to law enforcement that offer spying capabilities on Android and Windows Mobile. And they, they support you know all phones people are commonly going to use, um, and they provide all sorts of interesting capabilities. You know, logging of phone calls and text messages, um, usefully you know tracking of user location by the GPS of the phone, and probably most creepily. Uh, the ability to hot mic the phone. And so, you know, the, the phone sort of still looks like this, but it's ambiently recording everything that arrives itself. Um, which kind of was sort of odd doing research on this, because I was sort of looking through uh, sort of a, a decompilation of the code for this particular type of implant. The, the, the actual function that the, the developer had used was called spy call. Um, and when I looked at it and realized what this did, it sort of led to this odd dissonance between myself and this, this device, which I'm quite close to. So, you know, I wake up in the morning and like lots of tech addicts, I get straight on Twitter and, you know, and all of a sudden I found myself looking at this and I was like, ah, maybe I should, I should put this in the freezer. And then all of a sudden I was like, no, I've become one of those people. Um, so yeah, this talk's gonna be a lot about really cheerful stuff. Um, the last, I, I have a sort of a background in doing malware research. Um, and so probably the last really big thing that I did was I released an analysis, so I released a, sample, uh, a download, a bunch of spy software that was used by um, primarily um, the, the GCHQ, which is um, Britain's communications uh, surveillance establishment, uh, the sort of equivalent of the NSA. And it was used in attacks on the European Union and, and Belgium by the Five Eyes. 
Um, and so I released this through the intercept. Now, um, this, this attack uh, got a sort of a considerable amount of press because there were some people who felt that, you know, the Five Eyes in the UK, particularly spying on their close allies in, in the European Parliament and also Belgium was a little beyond the pale. Um, now, because of the amount of press, like this type of attention has got, it's kind of oddly skewed people's perceptions of threat and risk. Now, for people in this room, the NSA and the GCHQ are probably not your biggest threat. Probably, maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe you guys have stacks of ex-Soviet nukes that I'm unaware of, um, but, but again, you know. Um, but what I wanted to do is I actually wanted to sort of discuss um, risk and threat in a way that I thought would help people with their security problems rather than actually hinder them. So most people model threat really, really badly. Um, and it's kind of like we actually, and, and this, this isn't just online, this is in real life, right? This is why we're worried about terrorists but not drunk drivers. Um, we're worried about getting Ebola but not heart disease. You know, because we're worried about like really visceral things, things that are new. And so I've spent know, close to two decades now worrying about security problems. And I've spent a lot of time uh, tracking nation state attacks against high risk users. So I have a very granular understanding of what a lot of these types of threats look like and actually the, the sort of the frequency of them. Um, and that means you know, because, of, because of the news, you know, we get people who are like, so I read this thing about the NSA the other day and now I am super worried about all of the low level firmware on my computer being infected by the American government. Can you, can you help me check for it? Do you have any, do you have outstanding operations that you're committing against the American government? No. Um, like, I mean, is there any reason why you would think that you'd be targeting? Article. And then, yeah, <laughs> this, this, this does happen. Um, and so, I mean, another, another interesting exploits, right? What your, your cellular phone, which the vendor creates. So this phone is actually at least a system, right? And it's iOS. A, Qualcomm signaling the radio stuff. Now, I haven't actually watched the show, but as far as I can tell, for like six seasons, he just ties people to chairs and tortures them, right? Um, and, and, and this is sort of like the, the final end of what actually happens if, you know, the information that the state wants or whatever you're targeted, they can't, they can't get it. This, this, is, this is sort of like the final end of what could happen. Now, this is really, really expensive um, because you need, you know, in theory, I mean, you need black sites, you need people that are willing to pull out other people's teeth. And then it's sort of, it's politically difficult. Like you get Obama standing up on television and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, we tortured some folks, you know. Uh, they, don't, they don't actually, you know, leaders generally don't like admitting to torture. And then you get people from this kind of proud, really human rights activists. And, oh, it's, it's a nightmare, right? Um, and I, I'm not actually an expert in information extraction through torture. So we're not, we're not gonna dwell on this, <laughs> this type of action anymore. Um, but, but what I'm going to get into is I want to discuss now, like now we've talked about the sort of different types of actors that, you, that you're sort of worrying about in your security model. Um, what I want to do now is actually talk about the players, like who has these capabilities? Because now, now you know the types of attack that might be brought to bear against you. Chances are you probably know who you're worried about. So let's talk about what those people can actually do. So this is, this is the GCHQ. And this is actually, I believe, outside Cheltenham. And this is a drawing by Banksy. This is sort of a British graffiti artist. So this is a phone booth with a bunch of government spooks, you know, attached to the, attached to the phone booth. Um, everyone's heard of the National Security Agency, obviously. Um, so well, these, these are the high-end actors, right? And so this is the Five Eyes. Uh, this is Israel. Just sort of a top end actors. I mean, does this does this company does this country have a large military industrial complex? Do they have a Silicon Valley, a large gaming industry, perhaps? But like this sort of stuff doesn't spring up overnight, right? Like this is is you know 50 year ramp up times to developing this type of capability. Not so much in, in sort of software, but in terms of like a culture, right? Um, 
So they make you know, artisanal, small batch, you know, bespoke surveillance software, coded themselves in-house, you know, and the people that write it are probably fed, you know, smoothies and get facials while they write their government now. It's all very large. Um, you've got a kind of a second tier, right? And and these are these are governments that have cash, but don't necessarily traditionally have the, the the in-house capability to create these sorts of tools, right? Like they've just over the last few years realized they really want them. This is highly desirable. So what they're going to do is they're going to buy them. And so primarily what this does is it means that governments are purchasing primarily from Western contractors. So, you know, people gain this capability um, by working for Western governments. Then they leave, set up private companies because they actually want to make money and then start selling this type of technology to other governments. And so there's this type of middle tier. Um, it's a commercial market. Um, this type of software is frequently sold to law enforcement, intelligence agencies in countries that don't have the capability to write this stuff themselves. And occasionally, it's kind of gross, you sort of see it sold to security companies um, that will do things which might be considered dubiously ethical. Um, and this type of actor sort of is a, is a pay for tools strata of actor. Um, after this, what you have is you have. Uh, a, a strata that I'm, getting, I'm calling for the purposes here, cyber mercenaries. So you'll get groups, and I've seen groups in India, uh, Bangladesh, like Leo Impact and Appen, and that sort of thing, that you can, you can hire, um, and they actually have websites, right? You, you can hire ethical hackers as digital private investigators. And you have to think about, a little bit about what that actually means. So frequently what that means is say you have a court case and you really want to know what the other person is holding. You hire these digital private investigators here, and they'll hack the opposing counsel and steal all their emails and documents and give them to you, right? Um, I mean, th these, these guys are a legitimate risk, especially for people that are bringing sort of uh, important suits against, against government actors. Like, we've, we've seen, seen the use of these players in areas like Angola and so forth. So you don't even really want to pay for tools, right? This is a pay per job style scenario, right? Like, you don't have an infrastructure to build your own tools, uh, you don't actually really buy these tools as a service, but you have stuff that you need done right now. Um, and then there's, there's, there's one that, like, this is, this is what the security industry has traditionally been really worried about, right? And this is cybercrime, and this is sort of the Russian business network. These are people who like to steal banking logins en masse and that sort of thing, and you're, you're essentially monetizing cybercrime on the internet. Now, you know, this is, this is all about getting paid. Um, so for all of these actors, actually, the equation is kind of the same. And that's the resources that the attacker has versus the amount of money that it'll cost to carry out an attack versus the value of the target. Um, and there's this kind of one, there's a strata that doesn't really fit this. And that's um, the sort of hacktivists and black hats, right? And that's because these people operate largely based on ideology. Um, and, and their motivations are personal. Frequently petty, um, um, in, in the case of black hats, and they're, they're frustrating because you write what what type of research expenditure this person is stop going to do. Um, as as a as a former corporate security person, I found you know the, the, like with a with a government attacker, you generally know what they want, what they're trying to get, um, how much effort they'll go to to get it. With the sort of the dedicated black hat or hacktivist, uh, this is a lot more nebulous. Um, so, generally, generally, I, I put this group into like you should just not piss off people in that last category. With the former category, you may not have a choice based on the type of work that you're doing. Um, but this is all, you know, a sort of a very businessy transaction, right? Like this is in some ways how you need to think about security. Um, how efficient can we make these attacks uh, against our targets? How much do they cost? And you sort of do It's a fantastic idea. It performs a very specific function. It, it, it won't solve all your operational security worries. Um, so I kind of want to finish before I leave. I, I want people to ask questions and that sort of thing. Um, but I want people to start thinking basically into one thing like, Maybe not what your adversary could do, but rather know what they must do, right? So 
Sure, you can be freaked out about spies, space aliens, drones, base band exploits, robots from the future, and that sort of thing. But if you think a lot specifically about what you're trying to protect, um, that's, that's a great place to start. Um, so yeah, I hope that occasionally the tools that I give uh, and the sort of like, I come to you with problems, not solutions kind of kind of things, I hope I haven't really done that today. Um, so yeah, if, if people have questions, um, I'm, I'm here. Anyone? I mean, don't be shy, because generally what happens when I give these sorts of talks is that people sit there silently and then I get off stage and there's like a line of people who are like, so I didn't really want to say anything. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just going to address this. I actually tracked down the YouTube part. So I did Malaysia because actually did that. Yeah. Because I didn't know where it was. Um, but now what's happened is that now people are starting to put things side by side. Right. So I'm just wondering, is it possible to get a man in the middle on it once on top of that? So, so it is, uh, it, it, and it, the question you get to now, I mean, it, it is under variable circumstances. Um, it becomes more difficult and more expensive. Um, like once traffic is encrypted, the circumstances under which you can attempt to attack that encrypted tunnel um, are, are based on a variety of environmental factors. For instance, say you were watching YouTube using a Chrome browser. Um, Google, if YouTube is a Google property, Google also distributes Chrome, uh, it's, they actually know what their properties are supposed to look like. So functionally, it should actually be incredibly difficult to, to attack that. Um, having said that, to use another example, if you are using you know, browser X and looking at a random property online, um, and your government actually had the capability to coerce um, sort of a key signing authority for their country, sort of one of the pillar, pillars of trust, the, uh, the centralized model of encryption online, then it is indeed possible that they, they could read this encrypted traffic. Um, so, I mean, again, like encryption isn't a universal panacea. It's a really good idea and you, you, you should definitely be using it. Um, but yeah, let's see, we, we, we can talk more about that afterwards if you like, but that's sort of a reasonable answer to it. Yes, but yeah, other, other people couldn't. So, so uh, what the, the question was, uh, uh, to get this right, the question was that there's, you know, isn't there a move, you know, away from storing things in the cloud and, and, and you know, doing things online and that, that sort of thing? Um, does that just do? Um, I sort of. <laughs> um, I think there's definitely a lot more discussion about things moving in that direction. Like I've, I've done um, a few journalist security conferences recently where I've, I've had journalists say things like, oh, we need to move back to the old school way, right? Where we, we meet sources in a darkened garage, you know, and probably wearing a trench coat. And, and, and the, the, the issue I have with that is I'm like, right, and you made sure you both drove there in a car that doesn't have GPS, right? And you, you left your phones at home and your Fitbits and your, you know, um, so <laughs> there's, there's, there's difficulty in trying to roll back time, obviously, right? And there's, there's an expedience to online communication, especially, I mean, is meeting a source in person really safer for them, for the source? Mm, probably not. Um, but I mean, I think, that, I mean, there's, there's definitely a, a massive and powerful international discussion about whether or not we should be moving away to storing data in clouds, should, should countries have local clouds, decentralization, data localization. Uh, there's even sort of uh, panels and debates on this at, at this conference. Um, so I, mean, I think that that discussion is definitely occurring in a really important way at a, at a macro level. Um, and there's, again, a lot of this boils down to convenience. Um, so I have a, a colleague with whom, I, a partner in crime, if you will, with whom I've written many papers on state spying. And he, he laments my love of Google Docs. 
he just he just it, it boggles his mind because you know he's like, you're writing stuff on state spying. Why are you writing this at Google Docs? It's just so convenient. Like you're in Italy, I'm here. Like you want to send files back and forth between us over encrypted email. What is this? The nineties? <laughs> you know. Um, so I mean, even even so, I mean. I mean, I know I should be doing that, but it's so annoying. And so, you know, like, there's, there's, there's that, that friction between convenience and, and security that I think a lot, of, a lot of communities that have a very real reason to have these discussions, like this one, are actually having those discussions right now. It's like, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Maybe we should be doing that. And like, yeah, but the alternative sucks. I really want to use the cloud. Um, and so that's sort of basically, I mean, this is, this is sort of how the discussion is sort of going these days. Hello. Um, so what I liked is is this, the sense of a cost model and handling your resources of threat modeling in terms of capitalism. Cost modeling. So I was wondering if you could actually sort of readdress three points within the cost model. They're all the same thing. I guess it's uh, baseband exploits, uh, coercing an SSL CA to issue fake certs, and then the Adobe Flash Player pop up. Could you, could you sort of reframe those within that cost model? Oh, okay. So, uh, Colin wants me to reframe uh, to, as a sort of a cost or a price point. Um, what was it? It was the, the cost of coercing uh, a certificate of authority to, to give you uh, the, the type of key that would allow you to read and to traffic, uh, or a certain type of traffic. Um, the, the cost of a baseband exploit and sort of the, the Adobe for a fake flash and so on. And then with respect to the threat model. With respect to the threat model. So um, the use of, like we'll talk about baseband exploits for a second first. So, so this, is, this is a certain type of, of zero day, specialized type of zero day exploit, right? These are actually quite expensive. Um, there's been significant discussion about them in certain types of communities over the last couple of years, particularly the sale of exploits by researchers to government, um, which has actually led to a lot of people thinking that they're constantly targeted by zero-day exploits all the time. Um, these are actually reasonably expensive, um, and every time you use them, you have to consider them burned. So as, as a sort of a, a general price point, like uh, a zero-day exploit in Chrome would probably be about 300,000 US dollars, um, according to prices that I've, I've been privy to recently. Um, and so I mean again this 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 on the scale like there's the you know this is this is Mallory, this is the active attacker, and this costs money. Now and then like baseband exploits uh, are you know quite expensive, they're very bespoke, there's not many people selling them. Um, the likelihood that you'll be targeted one because you might be kind of interesting to the government is highly unlikely. Uh, like you, you would probably definitely have to be a person of interest. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's multiple dollar signs on, on this. Um, the, the cost of coercing a certificate authority inside your country, um, I mean, again, this, this actually speaks to a blended landscape, right? Because what, what you're essentially doing is you're augmenting the capabilities of the, right? Like you're already, your abilities to collect encrypted traffic are already there and they're basically free. What you're trying to do now is, I guess, read it. All uh, right, so you want to coerce people that, that hold the keys. Um, if they're inside your country, then this can actually be a relatively cheap thing to do. It can involve a specific type of threatening legal document. Um, however, it might also involve Jack Bauer, like, depending on how, how, how you actually operate. Um, so, I mean, the costs can be different. It can actually be incredibly cheap. However, if your country, the person you're trying to coerce is not inside your country, then what you do is now, now you actually have a situation like Mallory, and this actually happened where uh, the Iranian government broke in. To read Google traffic that they were intercepting, well not just Google, I think it was Google, Facebook, and a variety of other people, they were intercepting in country. So this is a sort of complex multi-stage thing, and at that point it does actually start to cost resources, right? Um, and the final one is, well, these are kind of curly, <laughs> the final one is Colin was sort of asking about that that fake flash player pop up that we saw. Now the interesting thing there is that it's actually sort of a cheap way of carrying out a certain type of attack. And that so this is this is Mallory. This this is an active team. This costs money uh, in in terms of this rig, right? Like you 
you're basically intercepting people's traffic and then injecting things into it. However, in this case, um, you're, you're actually attempting to socially engineer the user. It, it, it will work, even if people have been trained not to, to, to sort of be um, aware of these types of things. Because, I mean, everybody in this room cares about security to some extent, which is why they're in this talk. They've probably been given a lecture on not clicking on strange attachments and unsolicited emails. I got an email which said, hey, you're awesome. You're really great. So you give this talk with such dapper clothing. Um, you know, we'd really like you to come to our conference and we're prepared to offer you a $5,000 speaking fee in business class flights and we'll put you up a five star. Like, finally, the recognition I deserve. <laughs> you know? um, and, 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 you know, it becomes very, really, very really tempting to actually click on this sort of thing. Like, I mean, it's, it's largely about understanding the motivations of your target, right? Like in that sense, you know, you, you play on a, a sense of entitlement um, and, and, and a likelihood that, um, you know, someone, someone who does these conferences actually receives a lot of legitimate emails inviting them to conferences. Um, so, I mean, that, that sort of thing does work. It is reasonably cheap to perform um, in a sort of broad way. Obviously, you know, if, you, if that's how you're planning on compromising a specific individual, um, you know, then it becomes more expensive because you're going to start collecting information about that individual. Like, your success in this is based on largely on how well you know your target. Um, and so, popping someone up uh, an Adobe Flash update is a pretty generic way of trying to do this. Um, it's I, I would describe that on the sort of the cheaper end of the spectrum. I, I think there's a sort of a reasonable suggestion that someone might be like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Um, so, yeah, I hope that sort of answers your questions, but it. Let's see, once you start getting into it, as I said, it does sort of, it, it's, it's a blended landscape. Hi. Hi. Um, thinking about the similar sound state you were talking about, mm -hmm. the sound state you were talking about, right. Um, so I'm wondering, as these colleagues continue to develop, Why do you pay legitimate surveillance to watch your list? So I, I see this as a two-part question, right? So, so one is it was basically like you know most of the governments in the Southeast Asian context fit into a second tier, the sort of second tier of purchasing tools, and the um, the second one was you know sort of do we see it as inevitable as more and more governments will sort of create bespoke tools um, for, for surveillance purposes, um, and so. The first question I think is, is, is interesting. Like we've, we've certainly seen governments in this area, as I said, sort of Indonesia, Malaysia, um, you know, Vietnam, purchasing commercial surveillance tools from Western vendors uh, for, for these ends. Um, having said that, Vietnam actually has uh, so they have a security conference called BNZ. Um, they actually have a couple of different groups of sort of security researchers that are reasonably high profile. Uh, they have a couple of antivirus companies. They have a gaming industry. All of a sudden, if you actually start looking through like Microsoft advisories for Vietnamese researchers, you'll actually see that there's people developing high-end exploit and that sort of thing, which sort of gets sold throughout the region. Um, so it's not not all the countries in this region are necessarily in the second tier, right? Um, as as to the second question, like I I think there is an inevitability of in-house tool development. However, that's actually just because it becomes cheaper to develop these things, right? So, I mean, originally, the um, as, as the popularity of these types of tools increases, you know, sort of more tools for the creation of these tools actually start being created, right? Um, 
So a, a lot of stuff that used to be done manually um, can now be done in automated fashion, and it actually becomes cheaper for people to actually start rolling out this type of capability themselves. So I think we'll definitely see more of that, but that's because the, the, the price point of, of like boutique capability is starts driving down over time, right? So, you know, I, an interesting way to look at it might be at the rate at which um, attacks that are considered to be academic are implemented. So for instance, say NSA, maybe two or three years ahead of the public, like what's known. Um, whereas if you take, you know, sort of other countries with less money, fewer comp sci grad students or this type of thing, the rate at which they implement theoretical academic attacks might be actually like five or six years after you know, these, these things have first become public. Um, so I think that will probably stay sort of static uh, based on the resources of the country. However, um, it, it is becoming cheaper and cheaper to write this sort of thing uh, in certain areas. So yeah, I mean, I think the countries in this region will, will inevitably be enhancing their capabilities, which is, has been a, I guess an outcome of the Snowden revelations that I did not initially anticipate, which is that it's actually done a lot of great things for people selling surveillance technology. Because there's been this like, the NSA has all these toys. We, we need more budget. We gotta get some of this, like, come on guys. Um, and, and I mean, that's, that's a real thing and that's been happening. So I mean, I think that there'll, there'll definitely be there's sort of a definite inevitable increase in the sort of desire for surveillance capabilities in the region. Please. Hi. I'm Vicky from Texas. Um, First Look is still releasing original reporting um, based on the Snowden files. Are there steps that uh, First Look is taking? as a news organization um, that are unique to sort of having that responsibility of, of having those documents that um, people in this room may not be able to do, um, or is it just a combination of all of, deploying all of the tools that are available to um, your typical news organization or nonprofit? Um, you know, it, for example, the Jamalpa story that came out recently, which you were involved in, um, it's amazing to me that uh, these files are still there and they're still being discovered and released. And so I'm just curious, like, and from that, are there any lessons that people who aren't necessarily funded by the Omidyar can take um, to uh, protect themselves? That's a, that's, that's a really good question. Um, some of it I'm not going to answer. Um, and <laughs> like, so, the question is kind of so, so my organization is publishing and doing original reporting on the Snowden documents, which, which we're still releasing more of. Uh, he mentioned the, the Gamalto uh, attack story recently, when, and this was when um, it was shown that the, the NSA and GCHQ had compromised the world's largest SIM card manufacturer in order to, to sort of steal the keys for SIM cards, which sort of, you know, greatly enhances their, their, their cellular surveillance capabilities. Um, and so his question was, you know, have, have we done anything special in order to, um, you know, because, because there's obviously so much sensitivity around some of the documents that we hold and so forth. Um, and then, you know, what, what advice can I give to sort of other organizations in terms of human rights and journalism and investigative uh, research and reporting? Um, so, the answer is, yeah, we've, we've definitely, there's definitely been a, a bunch of specialized and indeed custom things that, that have been done at first look. Like I would, I would hope so, otherwise maybe my job is giving talks rather than doing security work. Um, but, but yeah, the, we actually have a security team at first look. Um, and that actually enables you, I mean, security is not, security is not about tools, right? Security is about procedures and infrastructure and, you know, software and, and tool chains and, uh, it's about a variety of things. And so I, I, this actually sort of gets in many ways to the heart of, of, of what I was trying to do here is that I, I actually feel that this community does have a very tool-based approach to security, right? Um, which I think is because it means that you don't sort of obviate the need to have specialized resource, right? Which, which I think we're very uncomfortable recommending that people need. So I mean, what we're doing at first look is we actually have security engineers, not 
not people who have kind of an interest in security, but actually a background in human rights, but they learn how to use PGP. Like, no, like, I mean, I spent five years breaking into computers for money, and then I spent six years in the Google School. Like, we have actual security engineers, right? Um, and, and I think that this is, I, I would love to see more organizations devote money and resource to that, which is kind of an ugly thing to say, because what people really want to hear is that the open source community should write a few more tools, and they just need to have better UX, and then everything's going to be great. Uh, and that's just not true. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think that, and if I wanted to be cynical, I could say that it's probably easier to get $200,000 to pay for a conference and fly a bunch of people into a room to have a discussion about security than it is to pay for security software. Um, if I was being really cynical. Um, but, 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 so, um, so, I mean, I, I, what I think that organizations need to do is, is sure, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of value in education. So, I mean, internally at first look, we, you know, all, all of our internal email is, is, is PGP encrypted, OTR is the default method that everyone chats. <laughs> All of our phone calls are doing are using Signal. Uh, we also do a lot more stuff that I wouldn't necessarily recommend that organizations do without dedicated security resource. Um, now, that's that's not available to some groups, for sure. Uh, it, it is available to others. For instance, I, I, I have been fighting this fight with regard to news organizations and that many, many news organizations do not have dedicated security resource, and yet they're owned by Condé Nast or Rupert Murdoch or, you know, and these are actually giant international conglomerates that, that could be doing a lot more to protect their users. So I think in some ways it involves like a perspective shift on how we actually see security rather than you know security is, is using core. Um, but but how, how that's done in a cost-effective manner is, is definitely challenging. Please. Um, thanks for the talk and congratulations on Thank you. <laughs> Given that speech, I was wondering, do you have any magic tricks? For getting small organizations, you know, maybe if you're based in, you know, London or New York or wherever place where they feel they're not a direct threat, and to understand the threats that they may face from uh, the, the government threats that they may face, say for instance, if they're working on um, uh, with human rights activists in Syria, and um, do you have any that tricks them to, to yeah, basically get them to understand that risk and start looking at what kind of solutions and pay for them to want to do kind of personal things to find freezer? Right, um, and I did admit to being the kind of person who wants to find the freezer. <laughs> um, so yeah, that the, the the question was, you know, um, uh, what you know, what do you say to organisations that are working in probably comparably safe geographic location, say, you know, the UK or the US or something, and they're working with groups in, in, in potential hotspots like Syria and that sort of thing. Um, how do you convince these groups that, you know, sort of security is, is really important without sounding like a paranoid nut? Um, so, I mean, I, I think this, this, is, this is, you know, really sort of hits the nail on the head, I think, a lot for, for this community. Um, I, I actually had a, a, a very visceral real-world example of this, where I, I, I was giving a talk a little bit like this one, but actually a lot, a lot more focused on actually the nuts and bolts of, of malware and government spying and how it actually works. And I had a gentleman walk up to me after the talk and he said, I think that happened to me. And I was like, what happened? He's like, yeah, so I got this email and it was apparently about this human rights report on China. And, you know, I opened it and then like it, it was just like the document was blank and nothing happened. And then I just sort of ignored it. But I'm just like thinking about it. And I, I had a look and I was like, oh, wow, this is actually Chinese government malware. Like, you, you're, you're a legitimate, what do you do? Um, and, and it turned out that he was, um, he was a lawyer. Um, and, and, and so he was prosecuting human rights abuses or try, trying to do so. Uh, was actually sort of his belly wing. He was actually very unconcerned that this had happened. Just it's like, oh, what does that mean? And I asked. This is this is kind of a thing. Like you seem very very relaxed about this, um, and, and and actually, in order to get through to him, I was like, so as a lawyer, would you not just be furious if you found out that the Chinese government had sent spies to your office physically to break in and then go through your filing cabinet? Like you, Ow, outrageous! It's like that's exactly what's happened. Like, wait, you know. Um, 
So I mean, like, even even actually explaining to people what the significance of being targeted in this manner is can can actually be challenging. Um, and I think I mean, pr protecting sources or, or you know people protecting the people that you're supposed to be trying to protect or help um, is, is is a very interesting problem, um, especially in areas where operational security failures on your part might have drastic consequences on their end. I think we're getting better at that as a, as a community. I, I really do. Um, I mean, I think that there's, there's probably quite a lot of practical examples. I think, I think staying away from, from freezer phone mentality is really important um, because it's, it's not, it not just makes you sound paranoid, it's also kind of paralyzing. Right? Because then people are like, well, I'd love to do something, but I heard that the NSA has actually put implants in all of my pets' brains. Um, so, like, what, what can I really do at this stage? Like, I'm, I'm just going to ignore this, right? Um, the, the way I try to do this is, is to get people to, like, to, I guess, judge how much security willingness I think an organization or a group of people has, and then try to pitch to that rather than be like, I am going to drag these people kicking and screaming through blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, maybe what I can do is sort of go in and be like, well, you guys are all in Palestine and you drive through Israeli checkpoints uh, constantly. Have you thought about just encrypting your computers and phones? Right? And then that's like a one day, one off thing. And I mean, so I, I guess like sort of picking the security willingness of the organization and trying to pitch what you think you can get done is, is, is probably a great first step. Anyone? Yes. <coughs> is Amnesty a tool in the police recently by Amnesty, the group of the, of the uh, organization being citizen map to scan this kind of design? Recently, Amnesty built with police um, uh, uh, scan software that you can use to basically look for things like hacking to you, putting Fisher by camera. Do you recommend that? And uh, are there other tools that you guys are developing that will look for those basic kind of things that you can See, no tool is going to do everything for you, which is. The point of, so, so you're talking about detect, right? Um, now, now detect is actually an interesting tool. Detect is is a very specialized tool for doing a very specialized thing. Detect is designed to see if your computer, your Windows computer, um, is infected with uh, FinFisher um, or remote control system, which is written by Hacking Team. Um, there's, there's no harm in using this tool. You simply have to know what using it actually means. And it suggests to you at this specific moment in time that your computer is not infected by these two specific strains of lawful intercept malware that are used by governments. That doesn't say that you're fine. It doesn't say that you will be fine in the future. Right? Like it's simply like, you're, it's, it's like getting a blood test for two very specific diseases right now. So you're like, well, I went to this country. Do I have West Nile virus? You don't. So, so I mean, like, I think I think using to check is, is is very useful if you have very specific worry. Uh, and I, I think that that's you got knowing knowing why you're using the tools you're using is so important. Which I think is is, is sort of uh, something I've been trying to emphasize during this talk. Um, so yeah, I mean, detect is is useful for checking for that specific type of malware. Um, are there any other tools that I recommend? I mean. To be honest, I'm not sure I recommend any any tools that aren't already being recommended by the you know many sort of capable digital security trainers in this space. Because um, obviously, when you're deciding to recommend a tool, there's this sort of balance of you know what does it do uh, versus how hard is it to use. Oh wait, no, there is one that I really like. I try to get everyone to use. Let's see if I can. Do it. It's on my phone actually, and 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 I I love it specifically because. This is great. So it has the best user interface of any security product I have ever seen. This, you can see my phone, it's it's currently off. Right? I'm gonna hit this button. I'm doing something really technical right now. Stage thing, and I'm gonna take this survey. Um, see, oh my god, it asks what's been paid. I've run out of my subscription. Basically, what this is, is this is a VPN software, and it has one button, and the button does on and off, which is freaking fantastic. Um, so, so I actually, you know, when people are like, oh, you should use a VPN, 
that's that's actually a great idea. And a VPN is an encrypted tunnel. So say you don't trust the Wi-Fi in the hotel or airport or wherever else you're staying, you can use this virtual private tunnel, which will, will tunnel you out somewhere on the internet in an encrypted manner. That's a good idea that you should use these things. This, like, getting people to set them up and configure them, et cetera, has historically been an awful drag. I don't like doing it on a phone. This was awesome because you have an on off button and it just goes. Um, the downside is it does cost, I believe, $2 a month, which I have discovered in life and just stopped paying. Um, <laughs> but, but I actually think that's actually not a bad price to pay for this. It's called Freedom, or Freedom with an E on the end, uh, so Freedom. Um, so yeah, I was gonna say, like, in terms of a tool that I, I actually don't feel, I know the guys that wrote it as well, you know, they're pretty sane. Um, so I mean, I guess, I am generally disinclined to recommend tools, um, but but that's not a bad one as things go. All right, sure. Yeah. Um, given that uh, government, uh, given that uh, a certain government uh, controls all mobile providers and there's no uh, law, you know, that can be enforced uh, against uh, invasion of privacy, is there any way to secure a smartphone? Why my phone? Um, that's, that's a really, it's a really tough problem, right? Because, um, is, is there any way to secure a smartphone? Like the, the, the difficulty is that you don't have much control over your phone. Um, so, I mean, in some ways Linux is infinitely securable because it's in, infinitely tinkerable. Um, that's not necessarily right. Uh, <laughs> as anyone in this room who's a, a long term Linux user knows, you can spend forever tinkering with your Linux box. Um, and the, the value, so it, it's hard because frequently your problem is that your, your mobile service provider is not working in your best interest from a privacy standpoint. I think it was actually the, I think the quote that, you know, sort of uh, information is the new oil or something like that was actually a Verizon executive. Right, um, and you know, in aggregate, of course, not you know, detailed manner, but you know, you you can tell advertising uh, companies that yeah, we, we've learned from you know the people that access our cellular towers with their phones that you know this neighborhood is largely African American between the ages of twenty and thirty five and sixty two percent male. You know, right? Like, I mean, they, they, they do keep a certain amount of granular data on you, on your movements and that sort of thing. And there's no real, I can't think of a single, like, privacy-friendly mobile provider. Like, I don't think there is one that's actually come out and see, like, yeah, we play for the users. That's, that's a tough problem, right? Like, um, and, and that has led many people I know to suggest that the mobile security problem is untenable. Um, so, I mean, having said that, um, there's the other side of things. Um, I think one of the most interesting battles to come out of the Snowden revelations is actually that that's occurring between uh, US intelligence and law enforcement and primarily Apple, actually. Because um, Apple recently, in a bewilderingly awesome move, um, they made iMessage end-to-end -end encrypted. Now, iMessage is like the default messaging app on, on your iPhone, right? It's, it's what handles the text messages and all that sort of thing. So it's got some problems, like you can't verify keys and blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't pass the, the, you know, the, the sort of the paranoid crypto nerd test. But what that means is that all of a sudden you've got 500 million users using end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. It's crazy. You can see why the US government is like, uh-uh. Uh, 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 uh. Right, and there, there was a big fight going on at the moment where you know the FBI director has been like Apple is helping the terrorists, and they're trying to get them to change the software really, really, really hard because it's actually real crypto on a commodity device and it's just transparent to the users. Um, so I mean that, that's actually a really interesting fight to watch to unfold. Uh, so I mean, yeah, the, the 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 cellular problem is a hard one, and you. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, this is a toaster, right? You buy an appliance and you get, an, you get an, a, a mobile computing experience, right? It is, it is not really a general purpose computing device as we understand it. Um, and so there's some good things and some bad things with that. The bad things is obviously that, you know, 
um, Apple are kind of jerks about their walled garden thing. Your mobile service providers are terrible, awful people uh, that want to give all of your data to governments and advertisers. Um, having said that, you know, in the case of um, Apple and iMessage, you actually have a reasonably widely distributed, easy to use encrypted messaging platform that they haven't even told users in is encrypted. It just is. Um, and that's actually a great way to get people to use encrypted communications. So, all right, I think I'm going to wrap this up now. Um, thank you all for coming, and I'll be around if you want to talk or ask questions. I'll be the person in the suit with dreadlocks. Thank you.